good morning uh, thank you all for being punctual and being here with us and i'm sure we'll all enjoy this we have a course on basic arthroplasty and we've tried to keep it as simple i welcome the faculty in particular people all the way from uk london they are dr michael pierce and dr ajay gupta we had dr carrington who unfortunately could not make it due to an ailment in the family uh, but we have got uh, his topic covered by dr rajesh bavari from our unit my main aim of coming up here is to encourage you to ask questions i said the same thing yesterday for the knee course which was fortunately very well attended and the harsh fact of the truth and a happy truth is that we actually had to get in two sets of uh, two rows of chairs added yesterday so it meant that there was excitement but more important than the chairs was that everybody on the chairs was asking questions don't hesitate to ask the question which you think is simple or silly because i assure you that is the question which the faculty will find most difficult to answer so please feel free to ask any questions you can i mean yesterday in fact it was so interesting people would actually stop the presenter and ask a question and we are quite happy with that are you comfortable with yeah. that yeah so that's wonderful if there's something which is really concerning and you really want to ask but uh, i mean not for fun it, it is basically or you can ask at the end of the that very talk and then there'll be ample time to interact we're going to try and put up some bone stations at the end of the day which won't be a very long uh, day as such and so those who would like to have a go can have a go at the bone models so i think we will uh, proceed and start with our first speaker merpon i welcome dr ajay gupta from uk who will be talking on a very important topic which is consenting pre op planning and templating dr gupta please Good morning, gentlemen. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be invited. For those who don't know me, I'm Ajay Rajan Gupta. I work as a consultant surgeon at Central Middlesex, and I'll talk to you about consent and preoperative planning over the next 15-20 minutes. I think before we start consent and preoperative planning, I think history is the key to patient selection. We've got to know about what pain he has, whether it's rest pain or night pain, the disability, whether it's how much you can walk, the stair disability. leisure or occupation restriction what are the previous treatments he's had whether physiotherapy or braces or mobilization aids what are the other concomitant past medical histories that he's had in terms of diabetes thyroid disorders immunosuppression which is pretty common now and of course have blood investigations prior to the surgery the consent has to be tailor made has to be tailor made to the patient to the approach whether we use a lateral approach or a posterior approach and to the processes whether we use a cemented total hip or a uncemented uh, hip of course it's important to know whether the patient is a old lady and whether we can use a cemented hip or a uncemented a younger male whether we use the articulation to be metal and poly or metal metal which is casually weaning away or a cobalt and chrome but in general i think the infection rate is about 1% in our clinical practice and i think i'll quote that to most of my patients a dislocation rate of 1 to 2% a nerve damage of about 1% a clinical dvt of 5% i think this would vary in india subcontinent the fatal pulmonary embolism is very rare limb length discrepancy the commonest cause of litigation in america is about 20% and fractures about 1 to 2% So how do we go ahead by uh, of pre-op planning? Of course, a patient could be pre-op planning could be for a basic X-ray as osteotherapy as this, or something more dysplastic like this. But it could help us in both. I think it's important to do pre-op planning to have efficient utilization of resources, to minimize the complication rates, and to have consistent and reproducible results. It shortens the learning curve while performing new procedures. it helps us to formulate our operative plan or alternative treatment plans it also allows us to anticipate interoperative challenges selection of appropriate implants very very often need to plan for specialist equipment in certain cases 
appropriate, appropriate approach, especially for revision in the arthroplasties, and of course, further investigations. I mean, it's very important that all the members of the team are communicated our pre-operative planning. So pre-operative planning, it includes history, examination, and the last is radiographic review or templating. I think many of us would review radiographic templating as a main objective, a main part of the period of planning, but actually it's a combination of all three. History, as I briefly mentioned, includes pain, sight, whether it's, from, whether it's radiating from the back or whether it's localized to the groin, whether the patient has a history of DDH, Perthes, or Sufi, previous history of trauma or infection, whether he's had previous surgery, incisions, dedication incisions, sight on hardware in the um, leg, but he's had altered anatomy because of previous osteotomies. And then finally come on to radiographic review. That of course confirms our diagnosis, the cause of the pain, whether it's arthritic, which is primary, whether it's rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, whether he's had previous history <coughs> of pathology of pages, sickle cells, or other comorbid conditions. And of course we need to know about the bone quality, especially if we're using uncemented hips. So the aims of the templating are to ensure optimal implant positioning and to ensure that the appropriate implants are available when we're putting up surgical procedure. We want to avoid disasters like limb length discrepancy or instability. The aims of implant positioning are that we can restore the normal center rotation, to restore the leg length, to restore offset, and to restore anatomy and biomechanics. Coming on to restoring center rotation. We know that the center rotation is too medial, it causes impingement and reduces the range of movement. And if it's too lateral, it causes inadequate cover and early failure. And if it's too high, it causes impingement and increased joint, of joint reaction force. So clearly we have to have the center rotation right at this point. <coughs> Coming on to the leg length restoration. Of course, we could it's important to optimize a leg length to optimize muscle function, to have cosmetic issues. And we could do that by either clinical assessment of leg length or X-ray templating. We can, of course, have to plan and exec execute the preoperative planning and also complement that with interoperative assessment of leg lengths. The clinical assessment includes both true length, which is from the anterior superior ilex spine, to the medial malleolus or apron leg length, which is from the umbilicus to medial malleolus. The factors that affect leg length is pelvic obliquity, whether it's the hip abductor contracture or adductor contracture, and of course lumbar scoliosis. <coughs> so why do we want to store offset? Offset is the horizontal distance between the center of head and the longitudinal axis of femur, as shown in the picture there. Of course, it has large anatomical variation. We also have a <coughs> vertical offset, which I'll mention later. And we could increase the offset by increasing either the head and uh, keeping the length longer, or we can have a high offset implant, or even do trochanteric osteotomy and <coughs> advancement. But what if we don't restore the offset? That decreases the abductor moment arm, causes the weak, gluteal to be weak, and causes limp. It increases the joint reaction force and increases wear. Also causes instability through trochanteric impingement and loose abductors. And finally causes lengthening. So finally we come on to templating. Preoperative planning, as you said, it forces the surgeon to fo think in three dimensions, assists the surgical team in preparing instruments, ensures adequate inventory to have required in implants, and may help predict complications during surgery that needs may arise. So we need a so we need an AP pelvis, actually which is standard, frog like lateral. I think it's important that we have a standard and appropriate imaging technique. Also fake factor into it the magnification, which is normally about twenty percent for a templating. The AP pelvis is done with the leg internally rotated 15 to 20 degrees. I think that's important because the cortices thickness changes with rotation of the leg and also the version of the neck alters. External rotation leads to underestimated offset <coughs> and prominent lesser trochanter. In the frog lateral view, I think we should do it with the knee 
off the table by about 15 to 20 degrees. And that ensures orthogonal view to the AP projection as shown there. I think the limb positioning is crucial in getting our preoperative x-rays. So whenever we've got an x-ray, we have to have a scale, a calibration device as shown there. Very often we now have x-rays which are digital. They could be of any magnification. Again, we want to look for a scale or a, or a calibration device. So what are the steps in templating? I think we should use familiar <coughs> implants whenever possible, the ones we are used to, whether in a training or in a clinical practice. We should use an estimated template to determine the center rotation and the implant size. We should correct for the leg length discrepancy and determine the femoral neck cut relative to the rest of the canter and the stem size. This is what a template should look like once you've done it. So what are the steps of templating? You've had an X-ray of the pelvis and the legs internally to 15 degrees. The first step is to have the landmarks. And the landmarks are two fixed points on the pelvis and two fixed fines points on the femur. So you've got the estable teardrop on the pelvis. We've got the inferior medial aspect of the estable, which is the teardrop, the medial lip, is the inferior margin of that wall and you draw a horizontal line across the two teardrops. Mark the center of the head and mark the two lesser trochanters on the femur. So this is an x-ray. We've got the teardrop on either side. Draw a line through it. Mark the two center of head, femur, a line through that. So these are two points in the pelvis, either we can use the ischium or the trio drops and the two points in the femur, which is the lesser trochanter and then you can use measurements to <coughs> uh, find out the leg length discrepancy between the two. <coughs> the next step is to identify the center of femur head. I think occasionally the head will be deformed, but the rough guide is to have the, le the level of greater trochanter or the tip of greater trochanter is the center of the head. The third step is to have estimated templating. We position it with abduction angle or inclination of 45 degrees, just lateral to the trip or lateral edge of the teardrop, as shown in the picture there. The medial as for the shell approximates the ischial line. I don't have a marker, but the ischial line is there. I don't know if you can see that. That's the ischial line. That's where the medial edge should be. And ideally, the cup should be completely covered by bone. And once we've done the leg length discrepancy, we've done the astabular templating, we come on to doing the femur templating. Again, the goals are to have adequate alignment of the femoral component, to have adequate fixation, to restore the leg length, and to restore the femoral offset. So there are four things important to get a femoral component right position. One is adequate alignment. It has to be along the intermediate canal, so you've drawn a line through that. And it should approximate the center of femoral head is where you want to be achieving your center of uh, head based on the leg length discrepancy. Second is fixation. So cementless uh, stems are normally proximally fitted stems. We have to adjust the template size <coughs> unless the optimal contact between the medial and the lateral walls and the cortices of the femur should be covered and achieved. I think like shown in the template. For cemented stems, you've got to leave about two to three centimeters of gap for the cement around the um, around the stem to have a thick segment mantle. Of course, the restoration of leg length is the last one. We aim for the leg length, uh, neck length in the mid range, and that allows interpretive adjustment whether we use a short neck or a long neck. The offset, of course, we could use either the standard offset or the high offset depending on the patient's anatomy, especially the contralateral hip. Decreasing the offset occurs if the femoral head template lies lateral to the anatomic center of head. And we know the, the negative effects of decreasing the offset that decreases the strength of the muscles, increases the limp, increases the polyethylene wear, and also causes instability. So, of course, increasing the offset is when it lies <coughs> medial to the anatomical head. So what's the accuracy of these templating procedures? Well, Aguiar et al. studied 100 consecutive 
patients undergoing primary THR by a surgeon, 90% agreement in the cup size, 92% agreement in the cement stem size. Of course, the leg length discrepancy was there. We had one millimeter or more was clinically and about two millimeters radiologically. But almost 80% of the difficulties interoperatively were anticipated with preoperative templating. The same was almost produced by Carter et al. And the correct size of cemented stems achieved in almost 82% of the patients done by residents. So sh I think we should use templating measurements as a rule, but using only templating as a guide. You've got to still base our uh, surgical approach and use tactile feedback using broaching and reaming to adjust as needed. In conclusion, templating ensures anatomical goals of THR are achieved consistently. It allows standard familiar model implants to be used in majority, shortens the period of time, ensures the proper implants available <coughs> to reduce surprises and disaster. And of course, we've got to be aware of various neck and narrow canals. Thank you very much. Any questions for Dr. Gupta, I think nowadays you have uh, fixed uh, programs which come with digital radiograph techniques which you can, you can um, use them. The problem with digital X's is they don't always have a magnification in them and you have to use the programs which come with them. It's quite the procedure is the same, so you have the two bony landmarks on the pelvis which could be either the tuberosities or the uh, tear drops, two bony landmarks on the femur which could be the GTV tips or the lesser canter. Go on to measure the leg length discrepancy, then measure the estabular alignment, which is normally 45 degrees inclination, and then come on to the femur. In a nutshell, uh, it's very difficult on uh, digital x-rays. For practical purposes, unless you have that software, as of the moment, you can't rely on digital x-rays to template the sizes and the lengths. Uh, th there are other ways to do it interoperatively. Uh, to uh, uh, you measure or pre-op, you measure the actual length, and then interoperatively you mark the size. And you know, with a marker on the acetabular side and the greater trochanter, you have a thread or something or a measuring scale, and then bring it down. So that we can discuss. But the point is that your question is very clear. That with digital X-rays, as of today, if you don't have the specific software, you cannot do a templating for size and measurements. And that also, <coughs> for that matter, even in the conventional x-rays, if you actually look at it, it should be properly, the picture should be taken exactly at a meter of the tube, so that you get a magnification factor of 10 to 15 percent. And that has mm -hmm. to be taken in account. The template should either have a mark on it that this is adjusted, the template is adjusted for 10 to 15 percent magnification, and then you do it, or you'll have to keep that in mind. <coughs> Any comments? <coughs> Michael. I go down to the department, if I'm working in a new hospital, go and speak to the radiologist and tell them what you want. So you heard from Mr. Gupta about internally rotating the feet. Try and get the sacrum, the coccyx, lined up for the symphysis pubis, so you know it's not, the pelvis isn't too rotated. You can easily get a femoral, uh, prosthetic femoral head, say 28 millimeters, and you can tape it to the side of the trochanter. So you, on your digital x-ray, you've got your radiographic marker and then you can work out. And then, as you heard, the accuracy is quite amazing, really. So you can tell your theatre nurse what size implants you want, but you can't stress enough the importance of templates. How many people here would template? Do you normally template? About two. Two okay. okay, thanks, Ajay. If these all topics are still open to discussion at any time during the during the whole course. The next talk is uh, on consent. The, this is anatomy and biomechanics of hip. This will be presented by Dr. Rajesh Bavari, who is my colleague consultant at Delhi. He has actually been instrumental in also putting up the book on hip replacement, where he has this chapter specifically on this very topic. So since we had. Uh, Dr. Carrington, uh, you know, being un unavailable at a short notice because of, as I said, discomfort in his family. 
So we fortunately have Rajesh available this morning to cover this topic. These first two, three topics are terribly important. You don't get these right and you invariably get into trouble. Thanks, Rajesh. Please. Thank you, sir. And a very good morning to all of you. I'll briefly speak about the anatomy and biomechanics of the hip joint, a very basic topic. Most of the things would be knowing it already, but we'll go ahead. We understand that the hip joint is a ball and socket joint. The ball is the femoral head and the socket is the acetabulum. It's a half sphere depression lined with the cartilage, the acetabulum, and it's got a horseshoe shaped lined cartilage. The ball and socket joint permits flexion, extension, abduction, deduction, external and internal rotation, abduction, deduction, and a combination of these, the circumduction. Briefly dwelling over the proximal femur, there's a head, there's a neck, there's a shaft attached to it. There are two protuberances, laterally the greater trochanter, posterior immediately the lesser trochanter. The greater trochanter giving attachment to the muscles, the abductors, the rotate, rotators, and the lesser <coughs> trochanter giving attachment to the flexors of the hip joint. The head has the lining cartilage. You will observe especially on the lateral view, that there is an antiversion to the femoral neck compared to the shaft, and also that there is a gentle bowing of the femoral shaft along the middle. The neck shaft angle of the femur is about 135 degrees. The femoral head, two-third of the head is covered with the cartilage, the head fits into the acetabulum, and we talked about the anterior bowing of the femoral shaft. The femoral neck, neck antiversion as seen here has to be emulated at the time of surgery at an appropriate angles, angle so that there is less risk of dislocation. Dr. Ajay already talked about the femoral offset. There is a horizontal offset and there is a vertical offset. The horizontal offset is a factor of the neck shaft angle and the length of the neck of femur. So both are important. The longer the neck, the more the offset, and the, uh, the lesser the angle, more the offset. Another important picture, the DOTS classification, uh, uh, a plain radiograph of the femur taken in internal rotation that gives us a picture of the cortical thickness, the cortical index, and it also helps us to decide which kind of implant we can choose from. Type A and B would usually fit, uh, do better with the uncemented implant, uncemented femoral processes, and type B and C, B shading over C and C, preferably would do better with a cemented implant. A lot of ligaments around the hip joint. The anterior iliofemoral ligament, the wire ligament is important and uh, re the capsule, if possible, gives additional stability. Once you open, open up the joint, that's how it will look like. This is an anteriorly uh, dislocated joint. Describing the acetabulum, the acetabulum has a <coughs> acetabular fossa surrounded by the lunate surface of the acetabular cartilage. The cartilage is discontinuous anterior inferiorly and it is completed by a transverse acetabular ligament which is an important landmark that gives us the direction of preeming at the time of doing the surgery and has to be preserved. The acetabular lab labrum surrounds the cartilage and this can be excised at the time of surgery. The, the other one is the lateral view. The lateral view shows the inclination of the acetabulum the version of the uh, acetabulum. Now this picture shows the acetabular angle which has to be known preoperatively to get a better, uh, uh, better fixation of the acetabular implant. This picture shows about the acetabular and the femoral antiversion which one should know before going ahead with the surgery. The concept and to utilize the concept while doing the surgery, it is important to, to avoid dislocation post-surgery to get the correct acetabular antiversion and to get the correct 
femoral antiversion. Femoral antiversion being about 10 to 15 degrees and same is true about the astabular antiversion. This permits better flexion of the hip and also at the same time provides stability to the posterior wall. And the same thing has to be applied at the time of surgery. To, one has to get the correct astabular <coughs> uh, abduction angle and the correct astabular antiversion. The normal leg shaft angle is about 120 to 135 degrees, but some of us will have coxa vera and some of us will have coxa valga. This has to be assessed preoperatively and the same thing has to be reproduced at the time of surgery to get correct length and soft tissue tension. Achieving soft tissue tension at the type of time of surgery is probably the most important thing to get a stable joint. This picture depicts the mechanical axis of the hip joint uh, of the lower limb which runs from the hip joint, middle of the hip joint to the center of the ankle, crossing the knee in the middle. On the lateral view, this axis lies just behind the center of the hip. So the body has a tendency of, you know, the center of gravity lies behind the hip joint. So the body has a tendency of falling back which has to be controlled by either the muscles or naturally by the iliofibular ligament which is a thick ligament anterior to the hip joint. The anatomical, the mechanical axis and the ana anatomical axis of the femur <coughs> subtend an angle of about 6 degrees to each other. The center of the gravity, center of gravity in human lies just anterior to S2 vertebra in a bipedal stance. When a person is standing, it is just anterior to, to the S2 vertebra. But in a single stance phase, it moves to one direction and has to be compensated by the abductor mechanism of that hip joint. If one is standing on the right hip joint, then the right hip abductors will support the, the body weight and this if not functional or has not been uh, recreated properly would lead to a waddling or a waddling gait. A brief word about peak contact forces. The peak contact forces across the hip joint while doing various activities varies from 5 to 6 times the body weight which may go up to 10 times while running and jumping. This excessive body weight and increased physical activity adds to excessive stress on the hip joint and that is why it has to be particularly avoided if the patient uh, uh, after hip replacement, in a, in a person after hip replacement. And somebody who has got a hip joint pain, an arthritic hip, again he should be avoiding all these activities. While doing joint replacement, certain you know, measures can be taken to decrease joint reaction forces. This can be done by shifting the center of rotation relatively medially, by moving the astabular component medially, but it has its own disadvantage, by increasing the offset, femoral neck offset. Previously, the uh, lateralization of greater trochanter was involved. Varus neck shaft angle, but it increases by doing by giving a varus neck shaft angle, you are increasing the uh, offset. But this increases the shear across the joint surfaces, the artificial surfaces. Using a cane in contralateral hand also decreases joint reaction force, which can be used both preoperatively in a patient waiting for surgery and also post surgery. And that is how your picture should look like after the surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Any questions for Dr. Rajesh, please? Yes. A little louder, please. Don, A, Don, B, Don, please, Don. Don, Please explain the TABC. This one. Oh, this one, yeah. Yeah. This is door A, door B, and door C. In door, in door A, what you have is a funnel-shaped top. This is the, this is a normal metaphysis where with very thick cortices. That's the normal shape. In C, it is a cylindrical-shaped uh, canal. There is hardly any cortex available here, and uh, and B is somewhere in between. A and B can take in a uncemented implant better because they <coughs> take a fix in the cortices below and they fill up the metathesis area. Whereas in the cylindrical kind of a 
bony structure, particularly on old osteoporotic females where there isn't enough cortices. If you try to put in a unsymmetric hip, it will not take its hold on the bone. In fact, the bone will be very thin to take the support. See, here the cemented system will do better because it will, you know, it will e equally distribute the pressure along the bones and additionally provide, uh, uh, you know, so safe fixation with the cemented processes. Yeah. The other thing about A is the canal is often really narrow and you can get horrible surprises. So beware the narrow canal is in really thick cortices, you might struggle to get your implant down. That's why you need a, an implant system with a range of possibilities. Have you got it or is, uh, is everybody <coughs> now clear about this or do you need any more explanation? I mean there's enough time but there should be nothing left behind. Okay, any other questions? Please, please, use you please use my case. Come to the mic. Yes, your question is audible to all audience. Uh, how do you uh, measure the uh, uh, anti angle in the uh, hip and the acetabular angle uh, while uh, uh, patient is on the bed and uh, he might be tilted on the bed? So it is apprehension. Okay, if the patient is tilted, I am guarding on that angle. And uh, uh, how do you check in intraoperatively in the uh, OT table? On the uh, X-ray, uh, it yeah, is a yeah, calculatable. Yeah. So X-ray, X-ray can be uh, deceptive, and uh, you have uh, when you are one thing is when you are placing the patient for the surgery, it should be placed. I mean, depending whatever uh, you know approach you use, the patient has to be properly placed on the bed. What we we use a lateral approach. And we put the patient by the side or the uh, on his side. So when we are doing it, the hip and the shoulder should be in one line. Sure. Make very, make very sure of that. Secondly, at the time of surgery, you have this uh, landmark of transverse acetabular ligament that you can use as a uh, as a landmark to incline your reamers. Okay. Thirdly, you have the margin of the acetabular cuff. You know, okay. when you when you expose the natural acetabulum and if it is not a very bad case where the you know there are not too many osteophytes, then you can use the acetabular margin as a guide as a to guide. do the reading. Okay. Uh, let me tell you, now you're talking. You are worried about putting the components in the hip on the table, on the right? Table. Yes. Now one is to try and get these 15 degrees this way, 15 degrees on the femur, or 10 degrees, and that is one. But today the concept is of combined antiversion when you're putting this in which means that basically it's like a, a power socket with a power plug. You don't want to put a, try and put a light socket in a power plug or vice versa. In other words, you try, you, you can get these with various landmarks. He's given you some uh, landmarks. You can even have uh, jigs for this purpose on with which you have, with, on which the cup is there and you have rods which will give you the version and inclination. So you get it even if you get it uh, 5 degrees this way that, that is less important today. What is more important is yes the most common landmark on the table today is the, teat, uh, the transverse acetabular ligament. You put it there and you get it at about 15 degrees of antiversion. Then you also put the femoral side none of them is uh, you know cemented and then you reduce this and then you see at 45 degrees in extension then at 45 degrees that it is concentric the ball is concentric in the socket. Mm -hmm. So if it is concentric, it is stable, then this is where you want to put it. And ultimately, it should be between 30 to 40 degrees of combined antiversion, which you are trying to achieve. That means 10, 15 here and 10, 15 there. Mm -hmm. Or five more there, five less here, doesn't matter. So this is the practical thing to do on the table now. So, we, so that if it will not dislocate with these versions, you are all right. You don't have to say it has to be 15, that has to be 10, and then go wrong by a few degrees. That you don't want to do. Thank you. Uh, any Rajesh. comments on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. <coughs> Rajesh, we often find that in our Indian scenario, we have a lot of narrow femoral canals, especially in primary and revision settings, and it is often diffi difficult to negotiate even in a size 8 or 9 femoral rema. So, uh, what should be the planning in that cases for the primary revision? Either the templating should be uh, properly done. We should know what we are heading for and uh, choose the size accordingly. And choose the size accordingly. And uh, thirdly, ha you should have a proper reaming set to you know to open up the canal properly at the time of surgery. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, and maybe a power driven uh, remix set uh, there's a need your, your question is for a revision no i mean the many of the time we find that the Im even the smallest implant is bigger for the femoral canal that we yeah his point is very well taken that if you if you haven't planned then uh, then if you haven't planned then you'll fail o on the table once in a while come up with a surprise but sometimes even after planning you might just find that uh, you know uh, as he said you might have a door a which you uh, under or over estimated and you have problem actually reaming there so in this case the important thing is to keep the whole inventory with you also keep the cemented uh, uh, even if you're planning an uncemented please do whichever you plan you consent for both in case you always keep an exit option and in that you will find say you'll take size 1 exeter or a size 1 c step you can find thinner ones you may not get your 3 uh, 2 to 3 millimeters of cement you may get 1 to 2 but you'll still have an exit out of it if you get into that reaming you can do to a certain degree you can increase it by a size or so but you can't ream so harshly that you can put a huge size please mr pierce one of the problems when you uh, have a very tight canal and you have to reach for the small stem say the cdh you then have a reduced offset. So you, you, you've solved one problem and created another. Um, what I used to do then was get the reamers that you'd use for intramedullary nailing in order to ream the cortex. You can't ream the cortex with a brooch. You're just going to break the femur. But certainly in Exeter now, they brought out smaller stems. So they're shorter and smaller, but they've got increased offset. And these are now being introduced in an uncemented. You know the stubby stems? And they have a built-in high offset. So there are more implants available for these problems but if you don't recognize them pre-op then you're really going to be in trouble the point is don't take up an unusual surgery if you're not aware of all the options that are available and if you're aware of those options they should be available on the table otherwise please stick with the normal ones there are plenty of those to do don't pick up something where you don't know what to do on the table any more questions Well, then I'll invite Dr. Ajay Gupta again on a very important topic, tribology, that is <coughs> the science of where. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just going to change the tone of the meeting, make it a bit more interactive. So I've just added a few things to get our fellows to um, just interact. So I'm going to talk about tribology in the next 15, 20 minutes. I can understand it's not a very clinical subject, but I'll try to make it as clinical as I can. So what's tribology? It's a word which is derived from Greek, of which means rubbing or tribos. So the next 20 minutes, we'll talk about two different aspects of tribology. In the first part, I'll talk about the science of attraction of surfaces, whether in friction, lubrication, or wear. And then we'll have a bit of clinical application, how we can use tribology, especially in sunnerbill joints, which are the native joints, and then in hip and knee placement, especially focusing on the hip today. So about this first x-ray, would anybody tell me what's the diagnosis here? Anybody from the delegates? Yes, good. And, and what is the cause? What's, what's the cause of? Yeah. Looks like an avian. Yes. So that's, yes, what else? So if you think of it on a more uh, tribology level, I mean more molecular level, what do you think is the reason? Yes, increased friction. The surface damage to the cartilage? The increased roughness in the cartilage? And what would that be? Maybe because of increased stresses, mechanical malalignment. You know, the cartridge is lost is is water supply. It's the water the uh, is more frigid. That's why it's causing more wear at the surface or poor lubrication. What about this one? What's the diagnosis here? Yes, polywear. And why is that? Well done. Do you think it's a high, high cup angle? Yes. Higher 
I have Russian angle well done. Could be an old poly, which is not highly cross-linked or wasn't sterilized properly. That's important, isn't it? To have the longevity of the polyethylene. You want to have a highly cross-linked and even have it sterilized in the standard method, which is gamma radiation. Okay, fine. And what's this? What's the diagnosis here? So if I want to ask you to describe the events. Well, there's increased wear, isn't there? No, I think where, where are the cuffs? <laughs> yes, <laughs> where are the cuffs? And then why is it gone medially? What's, what's the way done? What's the way done to the bone around it? Osteolysis? Yes. Is this really... All poly cups yes. that weren't cemented. Yes. So you've got wear on two surfaces. It just went mad. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. As Mick said, this, all poly cups were totally worn out because of the of the poly the sterilization or its method, and once once cemented it, so they've gone on gone through the astrobilum osteolysis, and of course there's poly debris around that. So that brings us to the question. How do we choose the article surface? How do we choose the bearing surfaces? Could be ceramic on ceramic, could be metal on metal, could be the standard poly. Of course, we've got lots of options there. In terms of heads, we've got the metal. We can have ceramic heads. We can have oxenium now. From the sockets, we can have ultra high molecular polyethylene, highly crosslinked. We can even have metal. Or ceramics, and we can, have, we can have various combination of these in our hip replacements. So that brings us to understanding tribology. Why do we need to understand tribology to get those figures right? So tribology is everywhere. You know, whether it's ball bearings, whether it's friction of skin creams or in food. So what's friction? Is the resistance to sliding between two bodies? We know that. Friction force is a coefficient times the weight of the uh, body. It's independent of the area of contact or sliding load or speed. So that's the load. The friction is coefficient of friction times the applied load. Of course, the friction is reduced by lubrication, and that's why we have synovial fluid in our joints. The coefficient of friction can't be measured or calculated through the equation. You know that has to be measured directly. Now, if I look at the coefficient frictions of a normal knee, it's 0 0.005, which is very good. And for hip, it's 0 0.010. The closest to that, of course, are the articular surfaces. Ceramic and ceramic is very low. The ceramic on ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is also very low. So, in summary, friction is resistance between two sliding bodies. It's a property of the interface and is reduced by lubrication. So what's the lubrication? Well, there are two types of lubrication, the fluid film or the boundary between the two articular surfaces. We have asperities at the joint surface, which are projections from the surface, both in the native cartilage or in the metal or polyethylene. And the surface roughness is more in high asperities, which are larger. The mean surface roughness, of course, is described in various different articulated surfaces. For polyethylene, it's 0 0.25 to 2.5, whereas for ceramic femoral head, it's 0 0.02, which is the least. This brings us to the concept of lambda ratio, which is the ratio of film thickness to surface roughness. The viscosity is normally internal, is the friction of the fluid. And we know that we have three times of film fluid or fluid film lubrication, the hydrodynamic, the squeeze film, or elastohydrodynamic. The boundary lubrication is like the polish on the floor between small asperities. Why do we need synovial fluid or lubrication in synovial joints? We know the knee or the hip normally takes five to ten times the body weight, the limited ability of the cartilage to repair itself. <coughs> And we almost walk 3 million cycles or steps per year. And of course, as the life expectancy is going, our cartilage is undergoing more stress. 
The cartilage is a specialized material. We know that. It has type 2 collagen and it has creep and stress relaxation. Creep is constant load, deforms quickly, increases the surface area, and gradually slow deformation till it reaches a steady state. The stress relaxation is constant deformation, high inertial stresses, and decreases gradually until the level to maintain the deformation. The synovial fluid, which lines the hip joints, is a clear yellow fluid. It has normally very small amounts. It's an ultra filtrate of the blood plasma and it contains plasma proteins. We know the synovial fluid is non Newtonian. It has a viscosity, which is the internal friction of the fluid, quite similar to the surface friction. The greater the friction, the greater the force is required for the fluid flow. The lubrication is special to the synovial joints. I'm sure you've read about beeping and boosted lubrication during your master examinations. And the cartilage has a micro elastohydrodynamic lubrication, normally for very small asperities of 0.05 to 1 micrometer. If you look at the hydrodynamics during the lubrication in the gate cycle, during the heat strike, which is the first phase, is squeezeful, and during the toe off, is weeping lubrication. So in other words, lubrication is essential to reduce friction and wear. And we have two types, the fluid film and the boundary. The cerebral joint, uh, joints are highly specialized for good lubrication based on the bearing materials, cartilage, the lubricant fluid, and the cerebral joint fluid. But that brings us to wear, which is a progressive loss of bearing material, quite similar to the radiographs we saw initially. It could be chemical, which is corrosion, or it could be mechanical. Mechanical wear is between intending bearing surfaces, between a primary surface like rubbing against each other, example, a femoral head and a model shell, or bearing surfaces with third body particles, which are the wear particles, or between two non bearing surfaces. It could be either abrasive, which is a two body wear, or three body, which is like the sand in a shoe, which is the extra asperities, or adhesive of fatigue, which is the result in delamination, more in total neoplastic. So the modes are mechanical modes, which could be between intended bearing surfaces, could be between a bearing surface and a non-intended surface, could be with a third party particle I just mentioned, or between two non-primary bearing surfaces. So abrasive wear is normally between two surfaces or two bodies. So we talked about adhesive and fatigue. <coughs> normally it results from scratches to the surface, it could be on ceramic on ceramic, or could be on metal or poly. This is an example of a ceramic debris in a metal revision and a uh, poly fracture of the ceramic liner there. This bond between the surfaces becomes stronger than the material bonds in uh, adhesive wear. And finally, the delamination or the fatigue wear which normally happens under the surface of the, sur of the cartilage or of the wearing surface. It results in pitting, delamination of fractures. So what's the method of lubrication, friction of wear, and hip and knee placements? What determines the wear rate of a cartilage? Patient factors, activity or age, the bearing material factors, the cartilage, and the joint alignment. The boundary lubrication is normally what operates in the uh, articular surface. The hard on hard surface are my metal on metal in for a fluid film. <coughs> the in vivo rate, wear rate of a THR is about 0.2 millimeters per year in young patients. For metal on metal, it's 4 microns per year. Also, very really depends on the polyethylene, the standard poly aging and oxidation methods. The irradiation of the X or cross link poly uh, improves the uh, wear but decrease, also increases the brittleness as shown there. Now we have highly cross link polys, which are new or many types. And there basically are a lot of polyethylene in the fibers laid together like a spaghetti. 
often increases the brittleness because the strands become shorter. Now there are two different ways. One is the linear way or the volumetric way. The linear way is when you have wear in one direction, normally happens with shorter sizes of head, or the volumetric wear, which increases with large head, head sizes. <coughs> so linear wear is in the vertical direction because a small head has point forces, and volumetric wear is three-dimensional wear, causes in all three um, directions, and normally happens with larger head sizes. And therefore, 28 millimeter head is the best compromise for these. If you don't want to harden hard bearings, you go ceramic on ceramic or metal on metal. The ceramic on ceramic bearing surfaces allows low friction, high wettability, the lowest bearing rates, inert particles from which doesn't cause osteolysis as you saw earlier. However, it's brittle and causes stripe wear and edge loading when the hip is deeply flexed. We know the particle sizes determines effects. If it's a micrometer size, rather than a metal or poly articulation, it causes osteolysis, as shown in this cascade. It also causes femoral neck thinning in a metal or metal articulation, as shown by Hing and Chimman in 2007, or a particle disease, which is also known as the Alva. So what's the ideal bearing combination? to the two articular surfaces. <coughs> I think age is the guide to activity for more than 70. It's a metal or poly. For less than 65, I'll go for cobalt, a ceramic or ceramic, or a metal or poly, highly cross-linked. For revisions, it's large head and a highly cross-linked poly. Thank you. Any questions? Lights on, please. Lights. You're welcome for the questions, please. It, it is a request that <coughs> please introduce yourself before answering any questions, so we can know who is uh, uh, putting the questions and from which place. And categorically, which speaker you want to ask, especially at, at the end of question answer session. Uh, Dr. Gupta? Yeah. Well, we are waiting. If you were to have a hip replacement, what it would be? I think I'll find the bearing surface it is cemented. And I'll go for a metal and poly. I think the reason is you've got to look at the long term results and I'll I'll go for a metal and poly and a cemented. To Michael. But you're you're so young, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is choose your surgeon. <laughs> Dr. Rajesh, what would it be? Uh, Uncemented, depending at what age, and uh, uncemented, and uh, maybe metal and poly or ceramic. How often do we do ceramic or ceramic? Do we normally have ceramic or ceramic? Yeah, delta motion, I think. Delta the, motion. The, the large heads. How many you are putting these uh, ceramic to ceramic? And we're doing ceramic on poly or ceramic to ceramic. Please raise your hands. Yeah, so nobody is doing ceramic. Is ceramic on ceramic? No, uh, it's the delta motion. Delta motion. That is, it is the costliest implant that is available in India. Any more questions? Will we move on? I welcome Dr. Uh, Michael Pierce to give his next lecture, which is on posterior approach. Good morning, everybody. It's a great uh, honour to be here amongst you, and uh, it's really a great pleasure as well to be able to talk about the posterior approach, which is my favourite approach uh, for total hip replacement and, uh, of course, uh, acetabular fixation of posterior wall and posterior column fractures. It has a great history, which um, I'll start with. Um, this is Langenbach, uh, one of the most famous surgeons of the second half of the 19th century. He was a great military surgeon, which many people don't realize, and the von was uh, uh, bequeathed on him, or bestowed on him, by the King of Prussia for his contribution to military surgery. He described as uh, a horizontal incision through the buttock, 
for the post uh, to uh, formulate a posterior approach to the hip joint, and then this was later modified by Cocker, who was the kind of uh, he's the Federer of Swiss surgery, one of the most famous surgeons of all time. He got the Nobel Prize for his work on thyroid um, problems, and so this is from this illustration is from. Um, that's the right button. This is from Cocker's book. And what he's done, he's taken Langenbeck's original uh, proximal incision and he's extended it and he's made it slightly more vertical or curved. And as we can see um, from, his, from his, his book, he's virtually described what we would recognize as the posterior approach uh, to the hip joint. And so by the 1950s, when there was an editorial in the JBJS on approaches to the hip joint, Gibson had described this approach as the facile princess, the uh, obvious choice, the, the leader in, in hip exposure. And we haven't even got to the era of joint replacement <coughs> surgery. Well, a little bit later, the Jude brothers operating in Paris described their hemiarthroplasty, and Austin Moore developed his self-locking prosthesis, hemiarthroplasty. And because Moore popularized his operation through the poster approach, it became known as the Southern Approach because he worked in South Carolina. A little bit later on, Robin Ling uh, developed his Exeter hip and I had the pleasure of being one of uh, Robin Ling's registrars and he taught me this approach. And he objected to the trochanteric osteotomy which was popularized by Charlie. Remember in England uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, if you wanted to do a Charnley hip replacement, you had to go to Wrightington, be taught by Charnley, attend his course, otherwise you couldn't use the prosthesis. And he said you had to take the trochanter off. Well, Robin disagreed, and that was one of the reasons he developed his own hip replacement, and he proposed and advocated the posterior approach. Well, then some years later, Lutzenel, who described the classification system of, for acetabular fractures before CT scanning, he was the first to coin the term Coca Langenbeck, but perhaps it should have been Langenbeck Coca, should have been the right way around. And so we have the uh, correct recognition of the, um, uh, import, the historical importance uh, of this particular approach. Well, before we dive into the nitty gritty of the posterior approach, we should ask ourselves what is an ideal approach? And these are the uh, features of an ideal approach, as you'll find in um, Hoppenfeld's Surgical Exposure book. It should be following an internervous plane, so we can retract the muscles without fear of damaging their nerve supply. It could be, should be extensile to get us out of trouble if we encounter problems. It should be relatively easy. We shouldn't have to have too much assistance. And the original Exeter hip replacement, the retractors had weights on them. So it was possible for a surgeon to do a total hip replacement without any assistance at all, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. We want an approach that's got a low complication rate, and we want an approach that leaves our patients with a nice cosmetic scar. Ideally, the scar should follow Langer's lines. So perhaps we're asking a bit too much. We can't fulfill all of these uh, criteria. So we've heard about the importance of positioning. And when I started at Central Middlesex Hospital, where uh, Mr. Gupta works, I, one of the first things I did was order these props. Okay, I saw them at one of the academies, and these allow you to get your patient fixed on the table. So what I do, I put them in the lateral position. I put the sacral prop in first. And if there's a, it doesn't matter if there's a, an epidural catheter there, I'm not gonna influence that. And then I make sure that the pelvis is lined with the shoulder. And then I put my fingers on the anterior superior iliac spines and I make sure that their one is above the other. And almost invariably, you have to internally rotate the pelvis or the patient a little bit to get the uh, iliac spines lined up and then I apply the anterior retractors, one there, one there and there's no pressure on the bladder. And you've got to keep checking that your patient remains stable throughout the operation and that way you'll know when you're putting your acetabular component in you can rely on your landmarks because they're fixed. So you don't just check at the start of the operation, keep checking throughout the operation. So here we are, prepped and draped. It's a really good idea. Always uh, uh, draw the greater trochanter, palpate it and draw it. Remember, the posterior border of the greater trochanter is what you can feel 
easily, particularly obese patients. And then the proximal limb is going to head towards the posterior superior iliac spine, and you're going to go down the femur for a variable distance. Now, the more you flex the hip, the straighter the incision becomes. Okay? So we're going to go through the skin, and then we're going to get to the fascia lata. Hip surgeons love to get the scissors out and go down with the scissors and, and up with the scissors. I personally just use a knife, and I, I will split this area here. And then we're on to glute, glute max. Now, it's not an internervous plane, unfortunately, but it doesn't matter too much because the innervation uh, by the inferior gluteal nerve is medial, so you're not going to innervate large areas of the muscle. Remember that the blood supply um, comes in like the spokes of a wheel. So as you split the fibers, particularly in the proximal half, you will encounter some blood vessels, and sometimes you can see them and diathermy them before you, you rupture them, because you can get troublesome bleeding in the proximal part of the wound. And if you've got an obese patient that's uh, deep within the wound, and then you're worried about damaging the sciatic nerve, so be careful as you divide the, uh, the fibers, okay? Remember the, the blood supply. So now we're getting to the back of the hip joint, and you're straight in. It really is a very straightforward um, approach. The, the nerve is usually deep within some fatty tissue. You haven't got to expose it, um, but it's nice just to palpate it, make sure it's there. Robin Ling taught me to make a small incision in the adventitial tissue here, just posterior to the trochanter, and sweep the soft tissues down, but try and leave most of the trochanteric bursa intact to try and reduce wound pain. Wound pain can be a problem, particularly in someone who doesn't have much soft tissues in this area. Okay, so we're not going to formally expose the sciatic nerve, but we're going to feel it. We know it's there. It's pretty close to the action. We don't want to, uh, to damage it. So then uh, we need to go a bit deeper. We find the posterior edge of gluteus medius, okay? And then we're on to this structure here, which is like a cord running across the uh, surgical field. What structure is that? Piriformis, good. So where are we going to put our retraction suture? And why? Common exam question. Where are we going to put our retraction suture? Body 